to the spectacular Amira Innovation Exchange at Memorial Signal Hill Campus. It's great to see such a super sold out turnout. Uh, I also see some elected officials in the audience this evening. I think I'd be all night naming them, so we're not going to do that. A uh, very special welcome to all of you. Thanks for joining us. Uh, tonight, we're very pleased to present this year's Galbraith Lecture in Public Policy, Election 2019 and the Age of Uncertainty with Evan Solomon. Uh, I would like to begin this evening's event by respectfully acknowledging the territory in which we gather as the ancestral homelands of the Beothic and the island of Newfoundland as the ancestral homelands of the Mi'kmaq and Beothic. We would also like to recognize the Inuit of Nunatsiavut and Nunatuavut and the Innu of Natasanan and their ancestors as the original people of Labrador. We strive for respectful relationships with all the peoples of this province as we search for meaningful and collective healing and true reconciliation and honor this beautiful land together. As Associate Vice President of Public Engagement and External Relations and Director of the Harris Center, my name's Rob Greenwood, by the way, if you haven't had that inflicted on you too many times before. I wear many hats at Memorial. I'm particularly excited about this evening's lecture. The Galbraith Lecture is one of the places where many of my hats all come together. The Harris Center role in public policy, defined by our brand of integrity and independence, over 16 years now. The engagement of MUN alumni under public engagement at Memorial, unique in the country. How many of you are MUN grads? Look around, Evan. Put up your hands. MUN grads. See that, Evan? We have 100,000 of them. And they all believe in Memorial, Newfoundland, and Labrador. And that's why we, the connection with public engagement is so key. And we're here at the Amira Innovation Exchange, Signal Hill Campus a campus committed to public engagement and innovation, to connect faculty, staff, and students, and alumni with partners across the province and the country and around the world. And we've been at it over a year here now. The place is hopping, and we're very pleased with how it's going. And what better topic for our Galbraith this year than the recent 2019 federal election and how the global political shift is affecting us here in this country and province. I'm delighted that CTV's Evan Solomon is able to join us, along with Memorial's Dr. Amanda Bittner and Memorial alum Tim Powers. It's also my pleasure to introduce to you Memorial University's Provost and Vice President Academic, Dr. Noreen Golfman, to bring greetings on behalf of the university. Uh, Noreen's been filling in a lot for the president over the last alumni week. She's been working every night. She's tired of me introducing her, but uh, she always delivers. So over to you, Noreen. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Rob. And uh, as Rob is hinting, my voice is shot. <laughs> um, but we've got great acoustics in here, so just forgive me my croakiness. Uh, it's croakingness that's coasting on um, almost a week of fabulous events in this space. It's been wonderful and celebratory for Memorial University. Uh, this is an awesome crowd. I'm really excited. So thank you so much for getting your tickets early. Very smart of all of you. And on behalf of Memorial University, I'm so pleased to welcome all of you to the 2019 John Kenneth Galbraith Lectureship in Public Policy. And I echo Ron, Rob's welcome and thanks to our special guests, Evan Solomon, alumnus, Tim Powers, and Memorial's own Amanda Bittner from the Department of Political Science. This lectureship is about bringing outstanding individuals to Memorial whose work reflects an exceptional commitment to scholarship and to public affairs, and tonight's guests are, of course, no exception. Mr. Solomon, Mr. Powers, and Dr. Bittman are, Bittner are three renowned experts in their fields, and we are very fortunate to have them address us tonight. 
And I expect there will be a lively discussion here. You're all almost all Newfoundlanders and you like to talk, so I'm sure there'll be lots of stuff to uh, hear from all of you afterwards, and we all look forward to that. So many thanks to the three of them for taking time out of their busy schedules to be here with us. And it's also great to see so many alumni and friends and students and faculty and staff. And there are some high school students here as well, proper thing, and friends of Memorial University tonight. And we are thrilled to bring you all together to take part in tonight's discussion. So this lecture series, obviously, is named in honor of John Kenneth Galbraith, an acclaimed economist and diplomat who was awarded an honorary doctorate of letters at Memorial's 1999 Fall Convocation. And the purpose of this lectureship is to facilitate discussion <clears throat> around the timely and significant public issues he himself generated and wrote about, and I'll, I'll just divert from my script here for a, a, a brief moment to say, I don't know how many people in this room have actually met Jonathan Kenneth Galbraith. Oh, my husband is nodding. Who knew that he did too? We have so much more to explore, obviously. But um, <clears throat> years ago, long before I met him, uh, I was um, doing some work at Yale University, and uh, I was reading a novel, an American novel by Faulkner at the time, lying on the grass in one of the courtyards at Yale. And this, I can only call him a giraffe of a man, sauntered into the green space, taller than Evan Solomon, and um, came, approached me. I was the only person in that space, and he came up to me and asked me directions uh, to find a building at Yale. And I had no clue about the geography of Yale, but I made something up and stammered. And I looked up, I looked way up, and um, I sort of faked it and said it was an honor to meet him because I had studied one of his books as a graduate student at the University of Western Ontario. As an English student, I had been given one of his early books called The Potable Scotch, which was all about his upbringing in Southern Ontario. Uh, a very informative book in my own education. So I'm particularly thrilled to be here to uh, be welcoming this lecture and our speakers tonight. So this lecture is part of, of course, Memorial's Leslie Harris Center of Regional Policy and Development. It's part of the ongoing work of that center to support active civic engagement through research and informed dialogue and debate on topics that are particularly relevant for this province. So this evening, we're gonna take a deep, deep dive into the forces and factors at play in the 20. 19 federal election and what they have to say about Canada's place in the world. And at the heart of our mandate is a special obligation to the people of Newfoundland and, and, of La and Labrador, of course. And whenever Memorial can play a role in facilitate, facilitating a forum such as this, we do well to fulfill that mandate. And this is the perfect example of that obligation. So events like this are not possible without the generous support of our sponsors. Memorial has enjoyed a very strong relationship with Johnson Insurance for more than 25 years as a provider of insurance to Memorial's alumni, a donor to scholarships, an employer of students, and graduates of our university, and a sponsor of many, many events, including this lectureship this evening. Newfoundland Power is also one of our sponsors, and since 2012, they have been a significant supporter of Reunion Weekend and our university. They also hire our students and our graduates. They work with our faculty members and our tremendous community builders. So in conclusion, I would just say the obvious that this lecture is a fantastic way to wrap up five amazing reunion celebration days here at Memorial, to which I have sacrificed my vocal cords. Uh, enjoy the evening. Thanks so much for coming out. Thank you, Noreen. I would now like to introduce our moderator for this evening's event, Tim Powers. Tim Powers and moderate probably don't usually go together. 
Tim is, if we know each other a little too well, like everybody in Newfoundland and Labrador, Tim is vice chairman of Summa Strategies, a leading Canadian public affairs consulting firm and the man managing director of Abacus Data, an opinion research company, both headquartered in Ottawa. He's a graduate of Memorial University, of course, and has experience and expertise in the fields of business, communications, and public policy. Mr. Powers is also a media commentator, appearing frequently on CBC's, sorry, Evan, Power and Politics. That was a joke there. And VLCM. He is also a writer for the Hill Times newspaper in the nation's capital. So has deep, deep knowledge of politics and this province. And over to you, Tim. Trying to be nice at the end there. I was getting a little concerned there, Rob. That's why I invited Dr. Hodgkins here tonight. She can look at our genetic patterns, or God forbid that that actually happens. Uh, just before I introduce Evan, clearly you're doing something right in your job. You must have shaken down all 100,000 graduates to have a facility like this. I recall this facility, as I'm sure uh, some of you do, as a hotel once, which I think you could rent by the hour. Mom, I never did that. I didn't do that, Mom. I'm just saying, that's what they said. That's what they said. And, Stephen Tomlin here, Dr. Tomlin, we would only have desks that maybe worked uh, that you could occasionally fold down. So okay. things have changed dramatically. Beautiful facility, glad to have you all here, but really glad to have uh, my good friend uh, Evan Solomon here. Now we both made a pact that I wouldn't read this long, long, long introduction. Uh, Evan and I well know reading an introduction is like giving somebody's obituary, though thankfully I'm alive and you kept it short. Uh, or it's as bad as a sponsor speech. So we must always thank our sponsors. So I'm gonna cut and paste, let us just say. First of all, one thing you may not know about Evan Solomon, but it's clearly where our friendship developed. He was an author of children's books. So he appealed to my infantile side uh, and uh, still does to this day. Evan, of course, I got to know working with him on, on power and politics uh, over, uh, I guess, seven or eight years ago. His uh, career trajectory changed. He's now hosting Question Period. He runs a national radio program that was once aired here on the CTV radio network um, and, and is well listened to across the country. He is a frequent writer in McLean's magazine and perhaps in this day when they are few and far between, uh, and this pains me to t admit this to him, but he is a legitimate public intellectual. Um, now that's the nice things I'm gonna say about Evan Solomon. Let me give you a little bit of the personal, although these are also nice too. Here's a guy who didn't just fly in to collect a check. He's not getting anything for this because Rob, you know, is pretty tight with the money. Um, <laughs> came in two, three days ago uh, to visit this province. To, he's been here often before, but, but came in, brought his son Gideon, who's here with us tonight. Give Gideon a hand, his first trip to Newfoundland. <laughs> To get a feel for this place, not to come and tell you uh, what to do and what you ought to think, but to really get a sense of what's happening here. And I think we'll hear a lot of that tonight when he speaks. Um, Evan, though, really became a, a good friend of mine and, and showed what uh, he has in common with Newfoundlanders Landers during some times I went through. When, when my father died, and my mother remembers this, and many of you knew my father, Barney, a, a colorful Newfoundlander and Labradorian, probably got drunk at the bar here when it was a hotel in the, in the, in the old days. But uh, when he died, which was entirely unnecessary, and I was on Evan's program, and it, it's touched me to this day, and I don't know if we've ever thanked you, but I did a little tribute to him. And that was very kind of you to do. Uh, not everybody would do that. Uh, it meant a lot to us, uh, it meant a lot to our family, and it spoke to you as a human being. And I say that to you as you listen to him tonight, and Seamus can, can speak to this as well too. A lot of people in Evan's profession, they're, they're wonderful people, but they're not often as grounded as Evan is in family and in region and what's important. Uh, the other thing I wanna thank Evan for um, is that uh, Later in my life, I became a father, and he has been one of the few people, or one of many people, but one of the few people I get to talk to on a regular basis about what signifies being a good dad, and you got a pretty damn good dad. And the fact that he's brought you here to experience all of this uh, is a wonderful thing, Gideon. We can trash him after, and you can still heckle him, and I'll still give you the $100, but we have to say one nice thing about him. Now, before I invite him up to speak, I found these two Galbraith quotes that I think Evan is going to pick apart in a different way, and I think they set 
the scene nicely for tonight. The first one is this. Politics is the art of choosing between the disastrous and the unpalatable. <laughs> and here in Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, no, it, 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 it is a joke, but it is also a reality at the moment. The other, which may well describe the recent election with respect to the elected officials that are here and others, it is a far, far better thing to have a firm anchor in nonsense than to put out on the troubled seas of thought. Evan, you're on top of Signal Hill. Welcome to the troubled seas of thought, my friend. Thanks, Well, thank you very much, Tim. Um, before I thank everyone else, I have bad news for you, Gideon. I'm leaving Mama for Tim. <laughs> that was the nicest thing anyone's ever said about me. <laughs> Talk. Say hi to Mom. Uh, no. I, <laughs> we'll get to that after. Uh, I do want to thank Rob and Noreen and, of course, my buddy Tim. Amanda, Lynn, Chris, Helen, a whole team that, um, that brought me here and um, gave me the honor of uh, delivering the Galbraith Lecture here at Memorial University um, and return to one of my favorite places, St. John's, and bring my, my beautiful son. And, and of course, to a place where hospitality is legendary and our friends uh, Mark Critch and Melissa took us around and Gideon got screeched in, actually, which was great, and kissed the cod. Kissed it a couple of times too many. It was a little worrisome, but anyway. <laughs> that's my other child now. Um, we saw the Chieftains play, which was great. And uh, they played with this, uh, you guys should see, he's a young up-and-comer here who is worth checking out. If you hear of him, a guy named Alan Doyle, which was well <laughs> worth it. I thought he was pretty good. I think he's, he's going places. Um, anyway, after the show, I was talking to Melissa's father, uh, who used to work at Memorial. And he said, uh, oh, I understand you're delivering the uh, Galbraith Lecture. And I said, yeah. He said, oh, you know I used to work on the Galbraith Lecture. I said, oh. And he sort of looked at me. And I said, well, you know, obviously since you left, standards have slipped. <laughs> Hoping he would say, no. <laughs> Instead he said, indeed they have. <laughs> Which is true. So you're stuck with me, and uh, and I. So tonight, uh, first of all, it's great to see a lot of people I know. Uh, I know I'm not going to name everyone, but uh, Jack Harris, I haven't seen for a while. Uh, congratulations, Jack. I know Seamus is here, and I don't know if Sean is here or anybody else. Some of the MPs that I only usually see on Parliament Hill, which is sort of turf that I like, and now I'm on their turf, so now I'm sure they'll get their just desserts, and I expect that later. But uh, nice to see Jack back, and. Uh, um, in the House. Um, I'm going to speak about the election a bit, uh, The Age of Uncertainty, which is, of course, from uh, John Kenneth Galbraith's 1977 book and, and lecture series. Uh, he was a very influential figure in my life uh, for a number of reasons, which I'll, which I'll get into. But, but as I was coming here, I got warned by Tim and probably by everybody, uh, don't think that you know anything when you come to Newfoundland. Don't talk to people here like you have any fucking idea that you understand this place, don't be condescending, don't call it the Maritimes, make sure you say Labrador, Newfoundland and Labrador. All these warnings, right? There's like landmines, which is fine, you know? And, and then somebody, I won't say who, but uh, one of your people pulls me aside in Ottawa, because there's a whole clan, and says, listen to me, if you go there and act like you know something, everything in Ottawa is lost in translation. I said, I know, I know. I like they go, no, no, you don't know. You think you know. He says, let me tell you a little story. There was a guy from Newfoundland who went away, and he left Newfoundland. And he moved to Ottawa like you, big shot. And he, and he thought he knew a lot, and he left his mom. And, and this is, I think, a Deb now. She's, Tim comes back to see wonderful Deb. And he says he left his mom, and his mom was feeling isolated and alone. So he thought, how can I help my mom? And in Ottawa someone was raising a parrot that had a perfect Newfoundland accent. <laughs> and he thought, I know what I'll do. I'll buy this parrot, which was very expensive, and I'll send it back to mom, and you chat away with the parrot. Perfect, and I always have company so I don't have to take the damn flight back all the time. So he sent the parrot back to his mother. He's telling me this. And after a week, he hears nothing 
from it. So he finally calls his mother, Collect, and he says, Mom, what did you think of the parrot? And there's a long pause, and his mother says, it was delicious. <laughs> and he said, that's how ideas from Ottawa end up in Newfoundland. It's not what you think. So I, th so I think everything I say could be the parrot. So I'm, I've taken that to heart. So with that in mind, let me just, uh, what I want to do tonight is I want to talk a bit about, so I got about a half an hour and Tim's going to, and then we'll have a debate and a, and a conversation. But I'll spend about 15 minutes talking about my view of the election, uh, election 2019, because it's just a week ago tonight. And then I want to situate it into the larger context, maybe a bit in the spirit of John Kenneth Galbraith and, and what he saw in 1977, a world that he was considered very uncertain, but of course we have a, a much different world than he did in, in 1977. But let me just quickly start with the, um, the election night. And I want to start with an image. I don't know if you saw the CTV coverage, which I, I'm sure most of you did. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure we were the only network on. Uh, I don't know if there's others. Um, and we were there, and Seamus would know there's, you know, we're there, you're, you're sitting on your rear end for about eight hours. And, and it's, and you know, Lisa's there, and I'm there, and there's a whole panel of pundits and formers, you know, Tom Mulcair and Rana Ambrose and Anne McClellan. And, and the night ends at about 10.30, we call it, you know, it's a liberal minority. And then the, the, the news is, how big will the uh, plurality be? And then at about midnight, you know, we know now what the liberals have and what the conservatives have and what the NDP have and, it's a, and what the bloc has and the Greens. And it's a real dispiriting affair. Canadians have wisely given everybody a chaperone. They've wrapped the liberals on the knuckles, and they have said to Mr. Trudeau, you know what, you don't deserve the majority again. We're going to give you a chaperone. It's a strong minority, but you didn't win. Where you're going to lose seats almost everywhere, and you should be humbled. And they said to Andrew Scheer, you are going to get some more seats, but not in the places you need them. You're going to lose in Ontario, and you're going to lose in Quebec. You're going to get them in the West, which is great, but they're not going to help you because we don't want you in power because there's a problem. And I'll get to what. And then they're going to say, and they said to Jagmeet Singh, we're going to cut you in half. Forget all that. You're going to go from 44 seats and 15 to 24 seats. So, and, you, and that, remember that orange wave? Remember the 59 seats Jack Layton got? That's all you can do now. Remember, there's one left. There's one left. Tom used to have one. And this image I want you to see right now is Tom Mulcair's face, because I looked over to Tom. And we're looking, and Jugmeet Singh is on screen dancing. I mean, he's dancing. And the NDP are dancing. Like, they're really going for it. And then he gives a long speech. And the longer he's dancing, the more bewildered Tom Mulcair is. And frankly, the more bewildered all of us are. Because he hasn't won anything. He's lost 20 seats from 2015. They have a 10, Tom's looking at 10 years of his life to build up that orange wave with Jack Layton and that team, and it's gone. And they're dancing. And Tom's like, what the heck? You know, it was like that party that you all had when you were all at Memorial University. I'm not saying people were stoned or drunk. Let's just say some people might have been. And your best friend who's had too much gives you that unified theory of life. It's like, hey, man, do you know what? I've got it. And you're like, this is, this is the thing. And you're like, this is actually really dumb. And in the morning, when you think that you're going to write this down, this will make no sense. But he's like, no, 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 it's so great. It's like, you're ham. That's how all the leaders were like. And Tom's like, why is everyone thinking they won? And first, so then Jugmeet Singh made like a very long speech as if he'd, you know, he, he, as if he'd won something. All Jugmeet Singh had done this magic trick of failing upward. OK? He had failed up. If Tom Mulcair and Jack Layton single-handedly wiped out they were, after the liberals and the conservatives tried for years, they took the nationalists, the bloc, out of Quebec. And this is the great irony. If the liberals and the conservatives had done what they should have done and taken those seats, what we all expected them to do, eat those 14, 13 seats in the NDP, Trudeau could have had a majority government. 
but he didn't. The block came out of nowhere. They took him. That saved Jagmeet Singh, if Jagmeet Singh's job, because the liberals get those seats and they get a majority government. Jagmeet Singh today is out of work. He would be the most colossal failure of, of, of the night. But he's handed his lifeline by who? The block. Because now he's the balance of power. So he loses 20 seats. He goes from third to fourth. And he's, but you know, somehow he's failed upward into this balance of power. We'll get to that. Andrew Shear then comes on, and I don't, don't get me started when who's talking over who, but Andrew Shear delayed, and he finally comes on. And he says, we got him where we want him. What, really? I, was it just me, or was a week ago you were saying, we will have a strong majority, we got him, right? Because of all the scandals, and he had enumerated them religiously, right? Like some kind of liturgy. SNC, ethics, Aga Khan, broken promise on the deficit, you know, first, you know, electoral reform, blackface, brown face, embarrassed face, everything. Couldn't beat him. And then he decided to declare victory. And he said, oh, I've got the strongest, I won the popular vote, I, I got seats, it's the strongest minority in history, opposition in history. But he bombed in the two places he needs, Quebec and Ontario, he lost. And in April, he's going to face a terrible leadership challenge. Conservatives are livid. Do you know that scene in every single submarine movie where the submarine is hit, and there's an alarm goes off, and there's always two guys that have to turn that door with the big wheel. It's in every single movie. And they go, shut the door, shut the door, the water's coming in. And there's two guys stuck in the compartment. Don't shut the door. And the guys, we got to shut the door, Jerry. And they shut the door. <laughs> They always do it. And then they shut the door, and there's a mournful, oh, we saved the sub. We lost a couple guys, but we saved the sub. But we had to make the sacrifice for the greater good. That's what the conservatives have done to the social conservatives for years. Stephen Harper turned the door. Jenny Byrne, and they all turned the door. They stuffed the social conservatives in there after they won, and they didn't let them out. And then Andrew Shear came along and was like, what's this door? <laughs> don't, don't open the door. But, but well, I like this door. Don't, don't open, don't. and he's opened the door. And, 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 the, and the social conservatives have flooded the good ship, the good submarine conservative, and the, the Ontario conservatives are livid. And, and when they're telling me, I mean, that means they've already complained to themselves and complained to other conservatives, and then they're like, you know what, and here's how it works in journalism. They want to give you a knife so you can stick it in them without, so they wipe the knife from their fingerprints, and they say, don't tell anyone but here's what I'm going to do. And then they give it to us. They go, it would be great if on CTV Question Period someone might ask about the leadership review. Right? I'm like, really? Your fingerprints are still on that. <laughs> but, and then you saw, you know, um, very senior conservatives now are, are saying, we can't, this guy can't win. Because it's 2019. And if you talk to Jenny Byrne, who was the campaign manager of, for Stephen Harper, she will tell you, as she's told me many times, 15 years ago, same-sex marriage was one of the more divisive issues. It was like abortion. It was a legitimately divisive issue. When same-sex marriage finished and the law changed, even the most hardened conservatives changed. It is not a divisive issue in this country. And conservatives took their opposition out of their platform because more than any other social issue in the world, same-sex marriage went from divisive to almost pure consensus, except for a couple people, like, I don't know, Andrew Scheer. <laughs> who, and it's a problem for Mr. Shear because no one cares if he walks in a parade. That doesn't matter. People care that he stands up for what Canadians, the consensus of Canada believes, which is the protection of minorities. Minority rights, which is the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which is a, not a contentious issue in this country. And what I'll talk about later is the larger battle over what is consensus between the left and the right. Charter of Rights is not that contentious. But Andrew Scheer's inability to walk beside people who are LGBTQ is toxic in Quebec and Ontario. And for conservatives, I'm talking about. Forget the opposition. And, he, and conservatives, countless conservatives. And Tim and I were with a conservative this morning who said, I'm a fiscal conservative. I have nowhere to park my vote because I cannot park my vote with someone that can't walk in 2019 beside someone who's LGBT. They just can't. And conservatives, and Andrew Scheer then doubled down after. I won't march in a parade. Okay. 
So he's going to face a challenge. But he declared victory. I don't know how you declare victory like that, but great. So now Singh's declared victory. And sheer, and then Justin Trudeau came, and we cut to Mr. Trudeau, and he said, we've got a mandate. What? You have 33.5%, sir. 33.5%, the lowest vote ever for a government in Canada's history. Now, that, you have to work hard to do that. <laughs> You've got to work hard in this country to turn a majority into a minority. That's why I always say, don't say Justin Trudeau doesn't work hard. <laughs> that takes effort. He had a terrible campaign until they had a good close. They have a very efficient vote. Um, and, and it was, people say this was a nasty campaign. It wasn't even, it, it could have been much nastier. It wasn't that nasty by our standards. We always say, you know, campaigns always, everyone feeds you a line of crap. Oh, this is the nastiest, most dispiriting. No, it wasn't. It's actually more policy in this campaign than anything I've seen. It costed platform. It's just nothing stuck. It wasn't that there was a scarcity of policy. They flooded the zone with policy, so there was no coherence to that. There was no narrative to it, but it wasn't for lack of trying. They were throwing your money at you all day. Everybody. They were, there was a fire hose of ideas, but nothing was coherent because it looked like the Oprah Winfrey campaign. You get a car, you get a car. And everyone's like, I don't believe this. It just, I don't really believe it. And there was a, the campaign didn't suffer for ideas. It suffered for authenticity, trust, and plausibility. No one believed that Andrew Scheer would protect LGBTQ if he wouldn't march with them. No one believed Justin Trudeau would follow through with promises after four years of breaking so many promises and making it look easy. No one believed that Jagmeet Singh could magically give us every service we want for free and still make prospect. And th there was a credibility gap and a trust gap that is corrosive. So we had lower voter turnout, lower believability, no one got a mandate. There was just no narrative to it. And what happened is Canada, always riven by normal regionalism, has become compartmentalized. Compartment Canada is really a problem. The rise of the bloc, again, we've seen this in 1997. The electoral map was pretty similar. We had a, you know, uh, we had a very similar map with the um, Quebec separatists and the Parti Québécois in 97 with Chrétien, right? And we had the Reform Party uh, as well in the West. We've, we've, we've look at people say, we've never been so divided. Yes, we have. We almost lost our country. We're not that divided. But the difference is we're divided in a new way. We're divided without a sense of why we should reunite. When, when I was in Quebec living there and we, we went to help protest you know, the, against the, in the referendum, there was a raison d'etre to be Canadian. There was a consensus. There was an argument for it. And here in Newfoundland and Labrador, you guys know because in 19, you guys in 1949, you know it because you, you lived it. Why should we join this experiment? Why should we be part of it? What's the trade-off to join Canada? And there was a reason, and it was a close call. And the argument to be part of the collective and to figure out what the social contract is has to be revivified by leaders all the time. And it's actually becoming hard to believe why you should be a part. And that's why you see in Quebec, I mean, imagine Quebec. They have the, outside of BC, the fastest growing economy in the country. They get $11 billion in equalization payment. We know where 800 million comes every year from what, somewhere around here. I don't need to mention that. They have a very, very confident young population. They've got some of the cheapest post-secondary education in the country, cheapest childcare in the country, excellent health care. And yet they voted to say no, to stand up for the, that's an astonishing, we thought that was over because they have a renewed generation of confidence and the insularity, it's back. The West also has developed this strangely passionate narrative of victimization. I just cannot believe this. They had 10 years of government. I'd speak to conservatives all the time, and they'll say to me things like, well, everyone's against us. The media, I'm like, the media? Like, literally every single post-media paper across the country, large chain, and the editorial was vote Andrew Scheer. You have your own newspapers. You have television programs. You have outlets. You had 10 years that the West wanted in. The West got in. 
10 years. And in 48 months, the West wants out? Because why? Justin Trudeau didn't get the pipeline built. Now, this is a curious thing because you have to be very careful. Again, it's like, you know, I'm come from away from there too. But you go out to Alberta, and I just, I'll pose this question. I don't get this victimization. I understand the, I understand the economy is terrible, and I, and I appreciate that. It's hard. When times are hard, you, you know, you get into your bunker. But my goodness, you have to really go down a pretty strange road to figure that the government's trying to screw you. Did the liberal government invent fracking in the US? No. That's a competitor, right? Did the liberal government stop the pipelines? Well, it's true, Bill 69, and we could talk about the so-called no pipelines bill, but that hasn't really been in effect yet. The, the Trans Mountain Pipeline with Justin Trudeau bought for four and a half billion dollars, there was no upside to buy that pipeline for Mr. Trudeau. It's a loser move. Progressives that he needs to vote from hate it. It's one thing to say, I'll support a pipeline and I'll support the environment. It's another thing to buy it with your money after you've already blown the deficit, after your finance minister has already busted the biggest province and is a lame duck validator, and it's important. Normally, a prime minister has a coherent finance minister who validates the credibility. Paul Martin to Mr. Kretchen, Mr. Flaherty to Mr. Harper. You have someone, Mr. Morneau is torched. Sorry, Mr. Morneau, I like the guy, but the moment in Markham during the small business tax fiasco when Justin Trudeau, Mr. Morneau was like this. He had his, you know, there, he had the, it was one of those shirt off, cufflinks in the, bed, in the drawer kind of moment, and he was gonna be, I'm gonna answer some questions now. And Mr. Trudeau realized his finance minister's on fire, and he literally pushed him aside on the podium. Do you remember that? I have the video. He said, and then and a reporter said, I'd like to ask Mr. Morneau a question. And Mr. Trudeau said, you have an opportunity to talk to the prime minister now. And the reporter's like, but we want to talk to the finance minister. And Mr. Trudeau said, I'll be taking it now. At that moment, the finance minister was no longer the guy he needs. Trudeau can't be everything. He can't be every character in the Avengers. He's trying to be, and it's exhausting. And Mr. Morneau's torched his credibility. And, and Mr. Trudeau was open about that. So, you know, here we are in this remarkable moment where Trudeau, Scheer, Singh, we're facing a, I know, we're facing a country that's very divided. And we have real challenges ahead. And, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll talk about that. So let me just, because just for time, so just park that because they all have fundamental challenges. And I'll just say one last thing. The, what you're seeing are three parties who are no longer able, and you saw in their victory speeches, to tell themselves the truth. They've been humbled, but organizations that can no longer tell themselves the truth have a hard time succeeding. And I think the real challenge Someone asked me today, well, what is Mr. Trudeau going to do about Western alienation and Eastern alienation? This is the biggest question. How's he gonna deal with Alberta with no people and uh, no MPs in Alberta and Saskatchewan? How's he gonna deal with the rise of the bloc? And the answer is, he shouldn't have an answer because he missed it. And Mr. Scheer missed it too. I mean, these are leaders who planned a campaign and was like showing up at your math exam and you realize you missed one of the key units and you fail. They did not calculate the rise of the bloc to this level before the campaign. And so how are we expecting them to deal with Western alienation, which after four years of government, they didn't see it. And the West is fascinating because the West is mad at Mr. Trudeau, but he bought this pipeline for $4.5 billion. The courts are holding it up. He's not holding it up. He's taken a big political hit for it, but he wants a bill. But the West doesn't think he genuinely does, or he doesn't want to build other pipelines. It's very hard to determine. They're mad now at Newfoundland and Labrador for voting for liberals. Like it was an act of betrayal. You come to work in our oil fields, but now you fly home and you vote lip. What? But this is factionalism and emotionalism. And it's no longer a fact-based argument, right? It's emotional. It's really hurting. And it's, I, I imagine here where the economies, you know, also resource-based economy, oil-based economy, also facing the same vicissitudes, a much less safety net, a much shorter uh, boom time than they had for 25 years when Ralph Klein was giving away checks, when they have no sales tax, they have much lower tax, and they are, they are in trouble. I'm not trying to compare pains. This is not like our pains worth I don't do that. But talk about the lack of empathy, where my pain is better than your pain. My complaint demands more attention than yours. 
This is a terrible moment. The, the rise of the culture of complaint. And I just, now let me just move to the, the larger section because I'm in my last 50 minutes now. I'm just kidding. Um, after it feels like four hours. Uh, we're at a really, so why is Canada particularly, this election particularly important in, in my view? And, and, and I want to also situate it here in Newfoundland Labrador. The world, we're at a really, I would say, if we were to divide the world into post-World War II, after the Second World War, and I'm going to get to the Marshall Plan just at the end of this. No, I am, because I'm going to end on that. Because the most, we should be all, the, the Marshall Plan is the most, in my view, the most important international moment. In it. it's, it's an extraordinary moment. And, and I'll get to that in a second, because from the time 1945 to today, the world has been fundamentally on a war, a battle for small l liberalism, which means what? There's a kind of government that protects the rights of individual freedoms and some kind of balance. And the march has been for, to mitigate the powers of the state and give protections and rights and opportunities to marginalized people, minority groups, women's rights, feminism, civil rights, LGBTQ rights, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms that we got here in Canada, in Africa, the emancipation post-colonial, which was a huge, huge movement. If you look, go to France and look what happened in Algeria, all over the world. This, and between conservatives and liberals, it was fundamentally a consensus on the four or five kinds of small L liberalism, right? Economic liberalism, personal liberalism, political liberalism, small L, right? What it means philosophically, and I'm sure Amanda will define it. And there's lots of books about it now. Mr. Tobe's got a great book out uh, about it now. There was a consensus. We were having debates about things that was within a commonly expect, uh, um, uh, a commonly accepted per series of parameters. And as we won these hard-won rights, they kept becoming more normative, right? Could anyone now say we should resegregate? Could we now in Canada say women shouldn't work? There should be quotas on Jews and Catholics. No, we couldn't do it. There's an acceptance of, and the larger scale, we built what? International, multilateral treaties and trade deals. Remember the free trade deals were such passionate deals. Now you got the NDP saying, we want free trade, but really good. For, well, oh, really? There's a fundamental acceptance of small L liberal values. And in 2019, they are under ferocious attack. They are being eroded and corroded in a way we have not seen. We have the rise of populism, which is people that use that term, but what is it? It's majoritarianism. It is the reversal of everything small l liberalism that conservatives and liberals and progressives have fought for on incremental basis. It is the majority rules at the expense. In Quebec, oh, we can't stand up to Bill 21 because it's very popular. Really? Jugmeet Singh could not be a teacher. How is this defensible? And yet, somehow, wise people say, well, you know, it's Quebec. <laughs> no, it's not. It's just, it's, the notwithstanding clause, which used to be the nuclear option, is now the normative view. We are in a notwithstanding culture not a notwithstanding moment. Notwithstanding the Charter of Rights, we believe we can pass Bill 21. Notwithstanding the rights of individuals, we believe that, you know, Donald Trump believes we can have, we can say this about immigration. Notwithstanding the fact that since post-war, the European Economic Union has been the most forceful market of prosperity, peace, and stability in the bloody fields of Europe, where you know all too well here from World War I and World War II. And I don't need to tell people of Newfoundland and Labrador about the blood and treasure spilled on those grounds. For 75 years, we've had peace, and they're ripping it down. Shocking. The shock absorbers of stability are under attack. And, and then, let's go back to John Kenneth Galbraith. In the age of uncertainty in 1977 was stagflation and Cold War. But in 2019, you have all the same old demons that are marching again, mixed in with 
nationalism, and fundamentally mixed in with the cop on the beat that was enforcing it, which is the United States of America, has lost trust of the street. You know, in downtown Toronto, if you are a person of color and you get pulled over by the cops, it's a moment of fear. I've never known that. I'm a white guy. I've never been afraid. I get nervous, you know, when cops talk to you, you always go, but I've never been nervous that I'm gonna get beaten. But you talk to someone, when you're afraid of the cop, you, it's, it's a very terrible moment of social instability. And the world is afraid of the cop right now, which is the United States of America, because the cop is not enforcing the normative multilateral traditions that we have come to expect for our prosperity. And it's a scary moment for all of us. And we are in a, and then you combine that, the lack of trust in our leaders, the corrosive cynicism that has been weaponized by populists for their own power and their own kleptocracy of self-profit, which is happening. The mass inequality between the super rich and the poor, which is creating, and our social structures that are the shock absorbers that are supposed to mitigate against the social tensions. Look, in 2008, Europe could have burned to the ground when Spain and Greece, but the reason it didn't is we, post-war, we had shock absorbers of financial institutions like international banks that were lending through quantitative easing. We had, uh, you know, unemployment insurance. We had all sorts of ways to mitigate against financial disasters becoming social disasters. Those are getting burned to the ground because we've got isolationism, we've got distrust, we've got, and these are, and now wrap it up in when we need to talk to each other more coherently, climate change. And scarcities create conflict. Rwanda, the conflict in Rwanda that we all think, oh, well, never again, the genocide, was triggered first by scarcities. It was first by droughts. The Hutus and the Tutsis, Tutsis didn't turn on each other because they just decided one day, oh, you're my neighbor, I'd like to cut your throat. They said, you've got more stuff than me, I'm gonna cut your throat to get it. That's scarcities, and we are about to have ma migration issues. So we need a world where we have to mitigate, we have to recognize and diagnose problems quickly, and we have to work together, and we have to bridge trust. So I know I have a 90 seconds, so let me just wrap up. No, because, and now people ask me, well, how are they gonna do it? That seems so negative. You're such a downer. <laughs> and I say, honey, no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> She says, no, no, actually you are. Uh, in 1945, just imagine that world. Imagine we've dropped a nuclear bomb on Japan and we've incinerated. Imagine we firebombed Tokyo and 200,000 people burned in a night. Just a, that's before Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Imagine Germany and France and England have fought two world wars. They, and my son and my brother and my father and uncles, everyone's dead. And then the United States says, you know what we should do? We should rebuild Germany. Huh. We should lend them money. We should, we should set aside $18 billion for something called the Marshall Plan. Here, George, Mr. Marshall, you should do it. And so they give Marshall this opportunity. And this is a really, this is the most important. And this is, imagine the level of, we think we have troubles. Imagine after the Second World War where there's blood everywhere. Des it's the most desperate time in history. And they, Marshall comes up with his plan. And they come up with the Marshall Plan. And imagine, saying to the, imagine a leader now would saying to the taxpayers, we should invest trillions of dollars in, in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. We should do all that and help the ISIS folks. Right? That's basically what it was when you're helping the Nazis. But they did it. And Marshall was asked this question. How are we gonna do this? How? Every country is destroyed. Italy's destroyed. Germany's destroyed. France is destroyed. England is destroyed. Their economies are eviscerated. Their, their generations have been wiped out. And Marshall's famous answer was, I don't know how, but I do know why. And if you figure out the why, the people on the ground will figure out the how. The Dutch have their own way, and the Germans have their own way, and the French have their own way, and the Brits have their own way, and the Germans, then the West Germans have their own. They even offered money to Russia. Russia didn't take it, but they did. And Marshall said, if we convince the American people to fund this, not how, but why, they will do it. And guess what? 
they did. By the way, a big chunk of the Marshall Plan was a communications. To, and why was it communications? Because Marshall knew if people didn't appreciate why they're doing it, they would never figure out the how. The how is the unleashing of ingenuity to solve intractable problems. There are multiple solutions to solve climate change. We have ingenuity in spades. What holds up ingenuity is the loss of consensus, social barriers. Social ingenuity, there's two kinds of ingenuity according to Tad Homer Dixon, technical ingenuity and social ingenuity. We have technical ingenuity in this world out the yin yang. We have a crisis of social ingenuity, how to get those tools to work. Marshall knew that if you guard the why, we can unleash the how, and people will support it. And I would just leave you with this. After election 2019, for your province here that has a crisis, for our country that is facing crisis, and for our globe that is facing a consensus crisis, a trust crisis, a social ingenuity crisis, a technical ingenuity crisis, we've got leaders that are, gave us a campaign of how and a shitty articulation of why. We have lost the why. And until we figure out a collective understanding of the why, and if we could do it in 1945 when Germans and French and Brits and Canadians and Americans, and we could come together and Japanese and Americans, if we could get over the bloodshed and the hatred and the war because we knew the why was peace, prosperity, and a better life, how can we not do it in 2019 in a much better world? And we need to demand of our leaders to re-articulate the why, to rebuild a sense of consensus and trust. And I think for Mr. Trudeau and Mr. Scheer and Mr. Singh and Ms. May, they are so busy promising us the house. Here's your money. Here's your boutique tax credit. Here's your this with their little Oprah campaigns. They have forgotten to tell us why we're Canadians, why we need this why we have to take on these challenges. And until we figure out a leader that can articulate the why, we are in an uncertain crisis. And we need to demand that. I think this campaign didn't do it, and I think we can do better. And I think we will unleash the Canadian ingenuity and solve our problems and help each other equally for a more just, fair, and friendly society. I give it over to Tim. Uh, Gideon, you can tell your mother she's safe. I, I, I can't stay with him every day if he's like that. That's just going to be exhausting. I used to think uh, corralling callers when I guest hosted on Open Line was hard. Well, trying to corral Evan is perhaps the most difficult job. Um, thank you. That was, uh, was magnificent. I have two quick observations, and then I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Amanda Bittner up uh, to speak. I think you... Uh, the one thing that I think probably struck a lot of people in this audience, particularly those of us who are Newfoundlanders and Labradorians, it's the issue of truth and understand, speaking truth to your circumstances and accepting that truth. We have a significant challenge, I think, in this province. Uh, starts with us as individuals and it goes to the very top of, of political leadership here. And we may understand the truth, we may not like the truth, but we take very incremental steps to address the truth. And we can talk about that further. And the second thing, of course, is this whole notion of loss of consensus. And certainly welcome Jack and Seamus and Sean and some of the other elected politicians here to comment on that. But we've put our politicians in such a box where now mechanized politics is all the norm. And the uh, encouragement of risk taking, the encouragement of stepping outside the structure of political marketing has hindered people's ability to have real and legitimate dialogues. And it's all about getting a 38.5%, not persuading 48 or 50% of people to come on side. And the skill of winning has been diminished by the systemic nature of it all. There's Foucault. How's that? You didn't teach me that, but I had <laughs> Foucault. He, he's imprisoning me today. But to liberate me and to liberate all of us, uh, I'm going to invite Dr. Amanda Bittner up. I have an enormous respect for Amanda. She, of course, is a, a top professor here at the School of, uh, of Political Science, 
like many of her colleagues here, has been a leading voice in getting out to the community. One of the things this faculty has always done is tried to take the problems of politics, the opportunity of politics, and bring them to the community and talk through them in a mature and responsible way. Amanda's also been a leading advocate for something that is absolutely crucial in this society, and I can, you can kick the crap out of me in the parking lot on the way out when I say this, but we're still way too goddamn paternalistic, and paternalism drives too much of the politics here. Uh, Amanda has been a voice trying to break all of that down, and I compliment you strongly for all of that. And with that, uh, you can put my lover back on track because I am totally at a loss. <laughs> Dr. Amanda Bittner. Well, I'm happy that I didn't get the kind of standard bio there either, so I guess there's some love in the room. That's good. I'm not excluded from that. Um, so I'm happy to be here. This is pretty exciting. It's a pretty packed room. Uh, it's, I was reflecting this morning that it's the first time that I have ever been invited to speak to an audience that paid to listen to me, <laughs> except for tuition, which I don't count because I don't get any of that. Well, I don't get any of this either, but I'm happy to be here for this. So I'm, I'm a little bit nervous, though. It's a, it's a pretty tough act to follow here. Um, so when I was asked to do this, um, they said, you know, we want to do this Galbraith lecture. We want to have Evan Solomon. What do you think? Do you want to do it with him? And I was like, what do you mean? Do I want to do it with I don't understand. What exactly do you want from me? I'm like, well, let's have a phone call and we'll talk about it. And I was like, okay, let's have a phone call and we'll talk about it. So we get on the phone and they're talking about all their ideas and I'm like, I still don't get what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> what do you need from me? I don't have any big deep thoughts on the Marshall Plan, for example. Um, and so I said, well, it'll be, it'll be great. He'll say some stuff. And then you could respond to it from an academic perspective. And I was like, OK, I guess I could do that. So it would really help me if I got some notes in advance <laughs> so that I knew what he was going to talk about so that I can like, do some research and think about some stuff and then say something semi-coherent so I won't embarrass myself into a paying, in front of a paying audience. And so this morning, he realizes he hadn't sent me anything. And it's uh, really, really common, let's just say that. Um, so I was madly scribbling notes about the Marshall Plan while he was talking. Um, so I'm going to go back to some other kind of thoughts that I had that I think will fit with some of the themes that um, Evan kind of drew out for us um, about this election, about what it might mean more broadly. Um, I think that. So the, the one kind of conclusion I wanted, or one kind of note that I wrote to myself, especially as he was describing the various successes of the various parties and, and the celebration that was taking place. So my note to myself, I'll read this out to you, who are the real losers of this election? And so that's kind of where I want to go with this portion, because I think that's an important question that we can ask ourselves. And that applies to this election, but it applies to all elections on a certain level. Um, so as some of you know, I study voters. I study public opinion, elections, voting behavior, that kind of stuff. It means a lot of survey research, a lot of number crunching, a lot of behind the scenes math, which brings me so much joy. And if I'm feeling stressed, I go and get a spreadsheet out, and somehow that makes me feel better. So that gives you a sense of who I am. So this off the cuff business that's happening right now, there's a high level of discomfort, let's just say. <laughs> I don't have a spreadsheet in front of me. It's a real problem. Let's, let's just say that. Um, so one of the things that Evan suggested was that there were actually too many issues that came up, too many policies being talked about, um, and that that was a problem for voters to kind of sift through all of that. And I think that that's both true and not true. And I think that the kind of discussion that we had during this election was um, it did help voters to learn some stuff. But it also didn't help voters to learn some stuff. And so this is kind of one of those ambivalent perspectives where there's lots of different ways that we can look at stuff. So if I think about the issues that stood out in this election, uh, climate change, right? I mean, there was an actual climate change march across the country in the middle of the election. So that's an obvious issue that came up. And that's an obvious issue that I think speaks to many, many Canadians. Did parties? clearly articulate their platforms and positions on that issue? Maybe not, right? Maybe not in a way that voters could understand. And so that was, in some ways, you can think of it as a missed opportunity. So if we think about the purpose of elections, well, at least according to nerds like me, the purpose of elections is to educate voters, to engage voters, to get voters thinking about things that they might not otherwise think about, because when it's not an election time, they've got jobs, hobbies, families to take care of, other things to do. And so paying attention to politics is not that easy, right? So elections are supposed to make it easy. So for that time during the campaign, we are more 
more engaged, we are more thoughtful, we are discussing more, and this is good for all of us, and it's good for democracy, right? That's the kind of ideal version of things. And I think that this election, we did not get that ideal version of things. We got a little bit of issues here and there, we got a little bit of discussion here and there, but it could have been a lot more. So climate change is an issue. Other things that stand out from maybe not real issues, but real issues nonetheless. So scandals, there were some, right? There were, there were plenty. Um, negativity, fear mongering, plenty of that as well. Um, obviously, the black face, brown face was an issue that came up. And that is a real issue. And so this is kind of what I want to get to with this, is that there are issues that are real in Canadian society, and then there are the ways that we talk about them during an election, right? So is the black face, brown face a problem? Absolutely, right? It's not appropriate to do that kind of thing. Was it used as an opportunity to talk about systemic discrimination and race in our country? No, it was used as a political football so that the Conservative Party could gleefully turn to, to Trudeau and say, ha ha, you made a mistake. A lot of us have made mistakes that we regret in our lives, and I'm not saying that we've all done blackface. But we've all made mistakes that we regret, and we can learn from those mistakes, and we can move on from those mistakes, but only if we actually talk about them as serious issues and talk about them seriously with, not the words, not gravitas, but like with content, right? As opposed to a fluff moment that we're just going to try and ignore. Um, so I think that's, a, that's an important thing for us to talk about. And that speaks to what Evan was talking about with regards to polarization. There's a lot of uh, us versus them right now. And we've seen it in relation to, you know, Alberta versus Newfoundland all of a sudden, which was one that I wasn't expecting. But us versus them in terms of immigration, us versus them in terms of race, right? Talking about carding in Toronto is a major problem. But people who live in our community here who aren't white also face a lot of discrimination. And we have to take that seriously too. Um, and I think that that's something that we have to think about, <clears throat> excuse me, as we move forward. Um, because this was an election where we could have talked about some of these things, and we didn't talk about a lot of important stuff. But that, I'm an, opportun or I'm an optimist, always glasses half full. There's an opportunity now to have these conversations. And so I think that part of the challenge for Trudeau, you know, he didn't really win, but he didn't lose as bad as he could have based on what's been going on, right? So this is a chance for him now. He says he's Canada's first feminist prime minister. I I quibble with that categorization. Like I think that there's probably others before him that were in that category too. Kim Campbell, for example. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, so show us. Put your money where your mouth is, right? Not just about a parity cabinet, but there's lots of things that the government can now do to demonstrate its commitment to some of the things that they supposedly stand for. Show us that it's not just communication. It's not just a game that we're playing. This is, as I would suggest, a serious issue that we have to deal with. What is Canada? What is Canadian identity? How do we deal with that in terms of policies, in terms of sending goods out to different individuals and groups? How do we mediate? How do we all work together? How do we all do that in a way that brings us closer together instead of dividing us? Because I think that polarization, we can see it in the US and we can say, oh, it's happening down there, that's terrible. Canadians don't do that. They absolutely do. Polarization was a huge problem in this election and will be an even bigger problem going forward unless we can deal with these serious issues in a serious kind of way. Um, so that's my very prepared <laughs> response. You did I should have cautioned Amanda in working with Evan for almost a decade. Yeah, you'd be damn lucky if you ever see a piece of paper. That mind is always in hyperactive mode. So what we're going to do here now, um, I'm going to pose a couple of questions and, and continue a little bit of a debate uh, among uh, the three of us. Uh, then in about 15 minutes, open the floor up to questions. I would ask we... When we do do that, we uh, avoid the speechifying. I'll, I'll cut you off. I'll do the old Trapper John's tackle. Having been a bouncer there, I'm still pretty good at that. Uh, so if you want to ask questions, please do it. But let's not get into speeches. I'd like to get as many questions as possible. And we'll get to that in about 15 minutes. Um, both of you touched on this theme in, in different ways. And, and this is the whole notion of you said the zone was flooded with policy. I'm probably more in line with Amanda. If it was a flood, it was the most tepid flood in the history of man. Um, I guess I can go camping if I were underprivileged or I can get my home renovated. Those are probably the two big things I remember. Why, why is it now, and I'll start with you, Evan, that politicians avoid what Paul Martin used to describe as 
dis transformational and vision discussions. Because I think Amanda was touching on this. We should be talking about bigger issues. Yes, climate change was mentioned in the campaign, but it was either your plan sucks and you're an idiot, or uh, mine is great and I'm a liberator. I would just quibble with the premise, not only because I love quibbling with you about any premise, yeah. even when I agree, but because you just happen to be wrong. So there's two kind of beautiful things here. No, no, no. What I mean is, what I mean is, I get that people. I understand there was a dispiriting element to this campaign. There was a lot of negativity. There was a lot of the usual cheap shots. And look, I get it. You know, you can't go to a boxing match and everyone goes, I can't. I hate that. Everyone keeps punching each other in the face. That's part of it. Okay, like that's life. This was the first G7 country to have a federal election on climate change. Let's just say it. Sixty. 66% of Canadians voted for parties that had a price on carbon. This is a historic moment. We forget it because we don't let, we're too humble to think of the historic moments. This was a very significant moment in a Western social democracy. Now, that doesn't mean that the plans were good or that there was consensus or that they articulated them well, but fundamentally, historically, we have to establish that we had an election, not that dealt with climate change or that climate, where the governing party used every part of their power to make it the ballot box issue. And the Greens and the NDP and the Conservatives had a, a plan as well. Again, I'm not going to get, I'm happy to get into the merits later. I don't want to do that now because that was part of what the campaign, but let's just acknowledge it was pretty significant. Secondly, we had also a very genuine discussion about pharmacare. The Liberals had a study on it. The NDP promoted it. I understand this has been before, but this is going to happen. I mean, this is not, this is not one of those. Uh, I understand there's always boutique tax credits and people go camping and the usual array of bribing people with their own money. That's tactical crap, and I get it. And it, some works and some doesn't. And it's OK to pick off your you know, to parse the electorate into how to build your 39%. And I think Tim's made an absolutely critical and wonderful and cogent point that one of the obstacles to building any kind of consensus is that in our democracy, 39%, and we can get into proportional representation issue, but 39% gives you 100% of the power. So every political strategist, they're not trying to win. They're, they write off 60% of the electorate. They data mine for 39%, or once they hit 39, that's all they go. And they tell the rest of the 60, go to hell. That's the logic of self-interest and math of a political party. And it mitigates against genuine consensus, genuine listening, because power is too attractive. That point that you make is, in my view, the most cogent and corrosive element of democracy, and we have to figure that out. But it doesn't mean that we haven't had serious issues. Now, you're right that there's two kinds of leaders. They're sort of, let's call them, I'm a football junkie, so the West Coast offense kind that want to throw the ball long. They get picked off a lot, but they score a lot of points. And the sort of handoff three yards in a cloud of dust. The incrementalists or the transactional types and the transformational types. Pick your metaphor. I'm sorry, I like football because it's less boring. But Trudeau was a West Coast offense guy. He, listen. Guys, I'm not, again, I'm not, I'm not pumping this guy's tires because I think I've been as hard on these guys for failing to live up to their expectations on multiple things because they, they snap promises like icicles in February. It was gleeful. But hey, they, after, tw remember, starting in 1980, this is just, again, these, we're, I just at least want to acknowledge where we are in the world. From 1980, the Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher era, till 2015, the conservative movement ran a brilliantly successful campaign to turn on government. That austerity and deficits were the only important thing. And it was in 2015, even to the point where Tom Mulcair, a progressive, had to, was so fearful that he would be tagged a deficit spender, social progressive, that he tried, promised to balance the budget and he lost the election. Justin Trudeau said, I believe that era is ended, that people want an activist government again. And he blew through the budgets and people didn't care. Now, we may have to pay for the Liberal Party with your own money, and I'm not advocating, but that was a transformational moment where activist government on a federal level came back, and that, and that government wasn't a dirty word. 
And then they decided we're going to spend on infrastructure. And we're going to legalize marijuana. And we're going to legalize uh, medical assisted dying. And they extended CPP and they got a health care plan. Hell, I wrote an article saying the liberals don't have a, an accomplishment problem. They have a stale bread problem. They did so much at the beginning that everything in the baker's window was stale bread. There was a lot of bread, but no one wanted to buy it. And they announced so much stuff that you could not ever figure out what the hell they were doing. Again, they flooded the zone. And so by the time people say, oh, they've accomplished nothing, I'm like, gee, I mean, give them credit. They, they had scandals and ethical lapses and all sorts of problems. And I think that hurt them. And I'll just say one more thing about that. But they tried. So they tried to be transformational. The problem is, like with Brian Mulroney, when you try to be transformational and you fail, you pay big. You win big, but you lose big. And the second problem with a transformational leader who, or a failed one, like Mulroney and like Trudeau, is that you become policy incarnate. And one of the problems with our democracy is we've become, in a constitutional democracy, it should be about our MPs, about our leaders. Trudeau took a, a first class brand and he carried it out of the ditch when the liberals were going down, third place. And when he won in 2015, he became the party incarnate. It was, he was the savior. And the problem is when his ethics became questioned through the Agacon issue, through the blackface issue, through the SNC and the ethics commission, committee, uh, the commissioner's findings, it was hard to separate the brand of Trudeau's ethics from the party. And because he was the party, incarnate. And he couldn't be transformational because, and that's when I go back to that point about Morneau, he had no proxies. He had absorbed everybody. And so people didn't believe he could be transformational because he himself failed to be transformational personally. And he's got to figure that out. He's got to be more humble and let his party go and his policy stand out. So I do think we've had a transformational guy who failed to live up to his expectations. Andrew Scheer pitched Canada a return to incrementalism. Let's go back to the incrementalism, small things. And Canadians said, we like that because we believe you can do them, but we don't think it's enough to solve the problems. And that's why he didn't win, because no one small wasn't enough and it wasn't inclusive enough. And he lost. And one last thing on Jagmeet Singh, he wasn't ready for it. He was parroting things, but no one believed he understood the depth. He may grow into it. He's a new guy. He, everyone says expectations are low. Let's be candid. Expectations are low because he blew it for two years. And let's, just, let's say it. He, he inherited a party, didn't fundraise, didn't get to the house of cards. Expectations were low because he put them in the ditch. Then he's smart and charming and clever and he was better in the campaign. But he didn't do much in the campaign because, you know, as Jean Chrétien says, the only thing that matters is winning in politics, and he lost. So let's just say I still think there's an appetite for transformation, but it's, it's tempered by no one believes these people can do it. I just want you to know you'd be a terrible guest on your own I know, program. I know, I know. You give the longest answers in the history of man. Thank you, though, for that. That was I great. Know, I, know. Uh, I know. It's true. It is true. Amanda, if you can give an answer under an hour uh, in response, that would be greatly appreciated. We nerds are known for all Well, I, I know. Yeah. I can't believe the new thing I do is in your talk. That's, a, that's okay. <laughs> but but, but to, reacting again, because your position was somewhat different from Evan's, uh, and I'm, I'm kind of with you. I, I get that you can stretch and make a transformational argument, and that not, doesn't come from a partisan perspective, but I, I think it's pretty generous to assume that this was an election about climate change. And what's your take on that? I agree with you. I mean, I think the thing to think about too, um, in terms of, you know, is Trudeau the embodiment of the Liberal Party, is that leaders have always mattered. Um, and this is like the thing that I like to beat to death all the time. Um, but, you know, from, and it's not just in Canada, but over time, across space, people vote for leaders. They think that they don't, they say that they don't, but you should not trust what they say because they don't know what they're doing. Right? In the sense that we're not good at knowing what our brains do and why they do them. We just do what we do and we, we go for it. And so for all of us, partisanship, who, which party we feel an affinity towards, that's a huge shortcut and we vote according to party. You know, our nans might tell us that they vote for the candidate, but they always vote for the liberal candidate or they always vote for the conservative candidate. It's, it's the party makes a difference. And the leader of the party, and yes, it matters more, I think, now that we have TV and radio and it matters more than it used to back in the day because we're seeing them more often, but it matters also because people like Evan are covering that all the time, right? So if we cover the polling, if we cover the horse race, if we make it a, a, 
sports football analogy about who's winning and who's losing. I mean, as soon as he did that, I started to like to tune out. But um, my wife says the same thing. She says, One more sports analogy, well, she's out. You've got Tim. Don't worry about that. That's fine. Um, That's fine, Trady. He's got to use rugby to squeak. <laughs> But so we've always done that. The leader matters, right? And I think that you're right. So, you know, this campaign in my mind was not a campaign about issues. It could have been. We could have heard more about issues. It was a campaign about leadership. And, um, you know, unfortunately for Trudeau, who was very popular beforehand and who was well loved by many, uh, it's his beautiful hair and eyes, I think, is a part of it as well. Um, but uh, his brand was sullied, you're right, in the sense that suddenly he seemed like maybe he was a bit of a hypocrite. Are you really for the people? Can you do blackface and be for the people? Can you kick Jody Wilson Rabel out of your caucus and be for the women? Can these things fit into one person all at once? And I think that that's a risky strategy, you're right, because all of us are not infallible, right? Um, and in the case of Sheer, yeah. And I think voters are more promiscuous than they were historically. They're, they're shopping a little more. But do you, and I'm not arguing. I, you're 100% right. It's about the leaders, even with the policy. And I don't think, I think they couldn't get out of their own way to actually elevate the policy. I, I understand that. Is there any way to do that? Are you saying it's just the nature of the time, the, the, the kind of e ecosystem of, of, of political coverage, that it's inevitable that we sort of flatten out the policies and make it into a personality I blame race? You. Yeah, well, that's 100%. okay. 100%. Media yeah. culpa, I get it. Yeah. Um, I think that's a big part of it. But I think at the same time, voters did learn something in this election, and it was about personality, right? They learned about the personality of leaders. For those of us that actually watch the debate, which, you know, people like me and some people like you, I imagine, who are in this room, because otherwise, why are you also here? Um, but for the average person, we don't watch the debates. We don't, we don't think about those things until we hear what media translates, right? And so, you know, those, that gleeful moment, and I'll never forget this, because I was watching, and there was wine, and I was enjoying myself. But, you know, somebody asked, it was Shear's turn to talk about indigenous something something. And he turned to Trudeau, like physically stood up and turned around and just faced him. Or he could ask anybody, and he chose Trudeau. But the look on his face gave away everything that it was just a football or whatever. It was not about the actual content. It was not about the policy. It was not about you know, Trudeau's track record on indigenous issues or women or anything else. It was about, ha ha, I'm going to get you. And so voters did get something out of that. They learned, this guy's a bit of a jerk. And this guy's a bit of a hypocrite. And that is actually something. Because you know what? Policies change, issues change, climate change is an issue now, and it wasn't 60 years ago. So people should learn, right? But Trudeau is the same now as he was six years ago. We just didn't know him as well back then. And so we are learning about personality. And their personalities will take them into the future. And that's how they're going to respond to the crises that we encounter yeah, later. Uh, can I just can no, I say, you know, I got to respond. <laughs> no, no, because. She's not, I, I man is right, like, look. You can uh, say I'm wrong. I will just show you the data, no, so no. it's okay. <laughs> yeah. When you inject facts into journalism, it's tricky. But it's really um, <laughs> look, look, I, I agree with you. I'm, I, I, of course, personality is right. Here's the problem with the data that you ha and that argument w when you scale it. We have had lots of different kinds of leaders. Like this idea that it's only the charming, charismatic leader that wins. We have, Stephen Harper was a very different personality than Justin Trudeau. He won for 10 years. We have different kinds of premiers who win. We have the charismatic, golden-throated metal arcs. And we have the mumbling nerds. And we have, we have all sorts of people that where policy, like politics is about you know, people care about different things at different moments. It's not just about, I know you have to, and it goes back to what I'm saying. First, you have to establish trust. And in order to have trust, then you have to deliver policy. And I appreciate that. But I don't think it's, I just keep pushing back against everything's just uh, marketing. I, and, I, and I'm saying, OK, good. Because it, it's, it's an element that's corrosive, and I totally yep. agree. But I still think we shouldn't pretend that there's not genuine ideas. I agree. They're just not getting the articulation and play they deserve. We are going to turn to the floor in one minute, if both of you can give an answer in one minute. I know it's a I tough one. I don't know one. we could do that. I, the only <laughs> thing I'm certain about is that that won't happen. But let, let me ask the question, right. then questions from the floor. We start a little bit late, so I can ask this last question to both of you. So we, we're sort of not talking tough truths. We're, we're, we're ducking some of the big questions in the room about this province, appreciating that 
Uh, you are not from here, Evan, but have uh, very good knowledge. And Amanda, you live here and teach here. So I will pull the pin out of the hand grenade here because I'm getting on a plane tomorrow morning and you can all deal with the fragments after the fact. Uh, courageous of me, I know. Um, back to this point of truth. So we have seen lots here in the local media. We've seen lots from uh, your peers and others talking about the hard truths here, what we uh, need to do with our economy, the choices we need to make on spending and where we should invest, the rural divide, something, a rural urban divide, uh, Rob Greenwood often talks about. What do you say, looking at this election and perhaps bringing lessons to Newfoundland and Labrador about what we ought to do and ought not to do in having the conversation about what needs to be done here? because things need to be done here and truths need to be spoken and we need to support politicians who have the courage to say we can't do things we, the way we once did. What, how, how do you respond to that? You are right. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's true and I think that we can all point to the <clears throat> 2015 election here in the province as an example of people not talking the real truths, right? We all knew who was gonna win that election. We all knew there was gonna be a change. We all knew that the, the province was facing tons of issues in terms of the economy, deficits, all that kind of stuff. And the, the kinds of promises that were being made by, the, the end, in the end, the governing party were about, we're not going to raise taxes, we're not going to do these things, we're not going to do all these things. And then, you know, six days later, they're elected, and then suddenly they're doing all these things like, we didn't know how bad it was. It's like, really? We all knew how bad it was. It's bad, right? And so we need to think about these things and have an honest conversation about them. And I think that, you know, in our evaluations of leaders, Good leaders are the ones who are willing to take the bull by, I'm really bad at metaphors, take the bull by the horns. Is that adequately sportsy enough? Yeah, well, um, and don't pawn off your sports metaphor on me. <laughs> See how useful I am? I did that, yeah. So, uh, well, some yeah. describe the election as a goat rodeo, so that wasn't bad. <laughs> <laughs> but like, we need to take leadership on these things. And leadership is about trust, and I think that's a really big part of it, and it's also about competence. Uh, but the trust matters more. So you know, saying you're going to do something and then doing the exact opposite four days later is not good, right? And doesn't build trust. And it also makes you look dumb, right? And so I think that this government federally can learn from that and you know, not make stuff up and then do the opposite because it suddenly is, appears that it's not possible when we all, we all know stuff, right? We might not all follow politics all the time, but we all have expertise, we all have insights. We know enough to know that we have problems, both here locally and also nationally. And any government that pretends that they're not a big deal is silly. And I think that, that the voters are smart enough to see that that's silly. Mr. Solomon, um, your prognosis on how Newfoundland deal with its hard truths in one minute or less. So, <laughs> take the bull by the horns. I mean, again, I'm not going to tell anybody in Newfoundland and Labrador, no one's going to listen to what the hell I say, but let me just say two things. First of all, a minority government is an incredible opportunity. People have been told a fib that minority governments aren't productive. They're incredibly productive. Pearson had productive ones, Martin had productive ones, Pierre Trudeau had productive ones, Stephen Harper had productive ones. They get along, and it forces people to listen a little. Even though this is a strong minority and the NDP and the Bloc don't really want to call an election so the Liberals can have a, they don't have to listen as much as I hope they do. And it show, in a balance of power situation, uh, small groups, it, seats matter. Seven seats here, people always say, oh, we only have seven seats, no one cares. They care about Ontario and Quebec because we have seven seats in Newfoundland and Labrador. But seven seats are meaningful in a minority government. So the first thing is votes matter. And minority governments are opportunities for small places. There are less opportunities in big, stable majorities because you can get lost. Two, leaders need priorities. Uh, at risk of sounding like a pretentious asshole, I'll just quote G.K. Chesterton. Oh, now I'm a pretentious asshole. Uh, <laughs> but, he, he said, once people stop believing in God, it's not that they believe in nothing, it's that they believe in everything. And the problem with, prior, with politicians is that we believe in everything. And yeah. I would just say to leaders, stop trying to fix everything. You know what people, why people don't believe you? Because when you try to fix everything, you fix nothing. Mm -hmm. Fix one thing. <laughs> Pick something. Yep. Get a win. Hold it out. Let people put it in their pocket like a stone so they can feel one for kakta, Yiddish word, win. Not everything. Pick some low-hanging fruit and show you can, you can, not score, you can have a win. On something, solve a problem, and then build on it. You know, little victories matter. 
not, you don't have to do everything all the time, going back to your transformational. A couple of wins build trust. Oh, you know, the guy that fixes your deck or the person that comes over, you know what, I like that person. Maybe we, you know, get a little win. So priorities matter and believing in little things. That, in my mind, would start the process where then, once you trust someone, then they can give a hard truth diagnosis. Hey, things are troubling. We need to fix it. Okay, let me, you're the guy that fixed the porch? All right, let me hear. Well, you know, you got termites. It's, it's a bigger <laughs> issue. We got to do, it's an expensive fix. You're like, you know what? I buy you what you're saying because you've been here with me. Yeah. And I don't think people do that. So prioritize and believe in little things that will lead to bigger things. And I think for Newfoundland and Labrador, a minority government is a perfect opportunity to do that and get some wins. That's what I would say. You, you sort of answered the question. That was good. Well done. Thank you. You interviewed a lot of politicians. You got there eventually. You would have carved them up a minute and a half ago, but I was too polite to do that. All right, we're opening the floor up. You don't have to be polite at all. Uh, are there mics going around? Where am I going? So again, please, no speeches, question, your name and your question so we can get as many questions as possible. Yes, please. A PhD student at Memorial University, Taylor. Uh, it seems that a lot of our political spaces uh, are very antagonistic. They foster mm -hmm. mudslinging at worst and debate at best, which tends to entrench people into their already determined positions. What kind of political and conversational spaces can actually foster the consensus and identity building that we need to come together as a country? Amanda, you want to start there? On account of my geography expertise? Yes, um, absolutely. I think that's a great question. And if you think about even the way that the, that the house is designed, right? We're facing each other as opposed to sitting in armchairs talking about sports or whatever. Um, <laughs> so there's... <laughs> <laughs> so we can do things definitely better. And I think that, that some of what you're talking about also speaks to the number of different kinds of institutional changes that we can you know, install to make politics work better for everyone, right? So night sittings are really bad for you know, women in particular who have caregiving responsibilities. Um, the lack of places to breast, like there's all kinds of things that we can do to make politics work better. And that's only really possible if we start seeing our opponents as people that we can work with to achieve change for goals that we share in common. Um, and so, I, you know, that kind of speaks to some of the stuff Emma was talking about at the very beginning where, you know, we need to figure out what are our goals and how can we work together to achieve them. And that maybe, I think he's right, that minority governments are a huge opportunity to have some of those conversations with people that we might not necessarily um, coalesce with, coalition with on a normal basis. But if you think about parties, right, I think we have this idea that coalition governments are terrible and that minority governments are terrible, but all parties are coalitions of people who don't always agree, mm -hmm. right, who have to work together. And I think that, you know, they can always do that across parties too um, to lead to more conversations. So, I mean, I have not, you know, been to Parliament Hill in a very long time and I certainly haven't been working in there. Um, and so, you know, my, my observations of things that we can do are limited to things that others do, right? And so, you know, houses that are built on the round, um, efforts to have, you know, cross-party committees. Um, we've seen some of that here in Newfoundland and Labrador, and I think that's been really, really effective uh, in terms of like mental health and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So some of those kinds of things could really improve things. Um, but I think too, you know, part of the issue might also be diversity, right? So mm -hmm. there's lots of evidence that shows that women in the U.S., for example, will easily work together from across party lines to achieve goals in the legislature. That could be done here too. So you elect different people, you get different kinds of policies, you get different kinds of institutional changes, and those new ideas don't come from electing the same old white dudes time and time again. And, and we need, can I just add something there? Uh, uh, what you've seen happen with uh, Catherine McKenna in Ottawa, Seamus's colleague, Sean's colleague, absolutely goddamn disgusting. Uh, what she has been subject to, what Kathy Bennett has been subject to, what Lisa Raid, any senior female political leader in this country has been subject to more misogynistic, hateful, racist dialogue, and everybody's got to call it out all the time. Uh, other questions? Can I, can I just add sure, something? <clears throat> uh, I agree with both Amanda and, and, and Tim for sure. Those are all true, but I, I just, I don't know why I always wanted to say, take an unpopular position. Um, first of all, 
we got to just make structural changes. The biggest thing that would allow this is we got to look at first past the post. I'm sorry. I mean, I mean, let's just be obvious, right? Is this is is first past the post the best system to breed consensus, or do we need some kind of proportion? We need a really thorough discussion on it. It's so obvious. Number two. If we really want to get consensus, we have to have justice. And inequality is preventing that. And we have to look at a much more um, innovative tax system. We do. We just have to be braver and talk about it. Uh, we just do. And marginal, people don't, if you say marginal tax rates, you put everyone to sleep. But marginal tax rates uh, for the super, super wealthy are a really important topic. It was brought up in this election. I know everyone thinks there was no, but the NDP, to their credit, brought in talked about a wealth tax and it was a legitimate issue. Come on. We've got to give credit where credit's due. Like these are real issues. Those are, those are legitimate. Again, I'm not advocating, the, but those, are, those were very proper discussions to talk about that. Two, we shouldn't demonize oppositional partisanship. I am not a partisan. As my, I could never, I've never been a party member of any party. Uh, I just, I, I'm not a great marcher. I, I'm probably that goat rodeo guy. But uh, I like partisans. Partisans get shit done. Okay? They fight for stuff. They march. They cut veins at night. They work hard. They do. I've seen these guys sleeping in the House of Commons. They work. It's real. And the democracy that we're defending is that we can be partisans without resorting to the disgraceful stuff that Catherine was dealing with or the violence at many other countries. What we're fighting for is the ability to passionately disagree and organize and fight for ideas without worrying about our personal safety or without alienating our neighbors. I don't like you, you don't like what I believe in, but we still give each other apples and we invite each other over and take care of each other's kids. That's a, democ a social democracy. So come on. We shouldn't hope for some time where we're going to elect a whole new group of people from whatever race, gender, religion, and they're all going to get... No. We, there are real things to do like that. I'm not discrediting. It's not the only answer. The answer is to exercise the muscle that is atrophying called empathy. Empathy is a muscle. And if you don't have empathy, societies break down. And you've got to walk in someone's shoes. And we have an atrophied empathy muscle here. And we should be able to disagree passionately. And, and I just want to say one last thing. The, the, the communication, no, listen, guys. Listen, the communications industry is a sophisticated industry that is packaging politicians and messages yeah. to get stuff done. They are more sophisticated, and they are data mining, and it is real. Yep. And they mitigate against consensus because they're paid to win. So being oppositional to cut through the paid, sophisticated communications, messaging crap, we got to bust down those brick walls and get at genuine dialogue. And it does happen through genuine opposition and calling out spin, but it must happen with empathy and respect and the cherishing of the ability to disagree without being in danger. And I think we need that. So I don't want to totally throw partisanship under the bus. I, I'm uh, keen on the clock, so I'm not looking at Kathy. I'm actually looking at my cousin, John Perlin. So when his eye goes down here, I know we have about five or 10 minutes. So you're doing well. It's only about right here right now, so it's good. Uh, Question there, and I would ask my colleagues if we can have quick answers where possible so we can get a couple more questions before the night's done. John. I'm afraid to ask this question because I don't think it's going to be a short answer. Um, first past the post. Uh, sorry, my name is John O'Day, and by the way, Tim, tell your sister I still owe that Guinness. Okay, so I'll pass that on. Uh, first past the post. If we had that now in this past election, what would the narrative have been and would the debate have been any different than we, than you described it? Either of you. I think that um, my answer would be yes. So every, so here's a good sports moment. Every, the rules of the game affect how we play, right? And so that's true about politics as well, which is why politics and sports go super well together, right? Um, so if we had different rules of the game, we would all play differently, voters would play differently, parties would play differently, communicators would play differently, and the game would play out differently. Can we calculate how parties might have done under a different system with math? Yes, but we'd probably get it wrong, right? So you could say that the, the Conservatives got 34%, therefore they'd get 34% of the seats. They may not have gotten 34% under a different system. And so we can't quite do that properly. We love to as nerds um, because it's fun. 
like let's face it, that's super fun. Um, but yeah, there's no doubt that if we had different rules, the game would be played differently, the outcomes would be different, maybe you'd have more consensus building, maybe you wouldn't. I mean, people fight in countries that have proportional representation too, right? So all of these things happen differently, but part of it is really just the way parties operate. And I'm not trying to say that I'm anti-party, so that's, if that came across in that way, that's not what I mean. Because um, parties are necessary for voters. Voters, as I mentioned, hobbies, jobs, families, et cetera, don't have time to pay attention to everything, every policy, every issue, every dynamic. They need parties to be clear and to clearly articulate positions so that they can say, aha, my party says this, your party says this, this is what I will therefore think. And we need that because we can't do that job ourselves. It's their job, not our job. And they're not doing that job right now, which is my issue with the, the current situation. Evan? No. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I just tried it. I would only just let say this, because I did that calculation. The Liberals got 33% of the vote. They got 46% of the seats. So if you think that's great. Uh, well, I, would it be different? Again, you know, I don't know what the hypothetical is. And we could debate. And I think Amanda's made a good point. Um, First past the post is easy to malign, but it's led to an enormous amount mm -hmm. of prosperity. It's led to an enormous amount of stability, and it's led to an enormous amount of um, dynamics. Uh, we've had a conservative party that's gone up on Mulroney, then down to two people, Elsie Wayne and uh, Jean Charest, and then they split. We've had the bloc go up and down, the NDP go up and down, the liberals go up. Hey, first past the post in Canada has led to an enormous amount of flexibility and volatility too. It's not been this static two-party system like the United States. So, you know, it's a little more complicated. Uh, you know, both have real merits, and Amanda's right. There's lots of uh, uh, proportional representative societies that are, are either in gridlock or riven. So again, there's not some beautiful answer. I just, my reaction is, originally, I think people are feeling an amount of distrust, and they want to be able to see a connection between the X on the ballot and representation in the House. And when you keep not seeing it time after time, it's a little disheartening, and we got to fix it now. Far be it, this is the beauty of being a journalist is I get to ask questions and I don't have to propose answers, but I do think that we would be um, remiss to not acknowledge the sense of frustration, and I believe you're right, the dialogue would be different, better or worse, it's a hypothetical, I don't know. All right, last question, where I can't, pardon? One question, one answer. One question, one of you guys are tough. One question. Just one ban answer. me from answering. We could have you. 20 answers, yeah, yeah, 20 go questions. Ahead. Okay. Go ahead, sir. Hello, Jason Kennedy. I'm a MUN alumnus, and I'd like to go back to a point that Amanda made, where you talked about the 2015 Newfoundland election, where the, gov the opposition made promises about things, and then six days later they had to go back to it because they were surprised at how bad the situation was. And I would love for the opposite. I would like. Jason, love can we get a question? Sorry, not yeah, to it's be coming. rude. I'd love for the No, I'd like it to come right now. Please. Okay. How does society. I do not think a government would win if they were honest with us. What has to change in society so that we would elect honest politicians? <laughs> we are doing that, right? Like, we're trying to assess their honesty, and the best way that we can assess it is by the things that they say, right? And so I think that, you know, the penalty doesn't come. So the penalty to the to the, the ball government in 2015 didn't come in 2015. It came the next time around when folks were upset and were unhappy with the, the record at that point. Obviously, you know, they're still government, but things are very different, right? And so minority governments, this is why I think they're not a bad thing, because they come about at a time usually when folks are mad about what just happened. And that's not a bad thing. So it's like, if you think about politics like a thermostat, right? The voters say they want something, the government delivers, so it's like the heater, a, a metaphor again. Turn the heat up, it's cold in here, so you turn it up. Okay, now it's hot enough, turn it back down. And so we do this as voters and as parties, but only if we can articulate the goals and what we need and what we want. And governments too have to articulate. So electoral reform is a great one, right? We just had a commission on electoral reform in this country. What was the goal? I do not know, and I love electoral reform, I study electoral reform, I think about electoral reform all the time, because I'm weird, but I don't know why they did that. They never said what was important about that, and so when they didn't actually pass those changes or those, the recommendations, I wasn't surprised, because like, they didn't know what they wanted to do in the first place. And so that part is the part that I think voters need more of, and that's up to governments and parties to articulate. If we're going to talk electoral reform, they're going to have to reopen the bar here in the battery, and uh, we'll all go in there. All right. 
Apparently, uh, the Mun leadership team has told me no more questions, so I have to ask you my. She's getting mad now. You've you've listened to that long. No, oh, keep. You no, know, you would keep giving me different instructions. No wonder your children. Are... We need to know the rules of the game so we can play it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right, another ten minutes. All right, other quick questions. Sure, go ahead. Uh, Evan, I followed you for years, and you too, Tim. Um, I'm um, Sue Rose, um, I guess an LGBT2QS uh, youth advocate. And I want to just touch on something because I feel uh, that uh, Pierre, uh, obviously Trudeau, uh, established um, some sort of a beginning for our journey in 69, keeping the state out of the bedrooms. And then his son, of course, apologized to our community. And um, when Trinity Western campaign, was it 50 million? Was it 100 million to keep the queers out of their law school? And I'm wondering why it didn't get much traction because if it was any other minority there would have been protesting in the street and I'm talking about CBC now just releasing the uh, the documentary this is not something new to me I'm on several committees national committees and international committees about bullying and all this stuff indigenous and the LGBTQ2S community are the most vulnerable in our schools so why don't you cover it more when it is a human rights issue and it does uh, involve the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Uh, in most schools today, we are invisible. In most schools today, if you, if you bring it out that, you know, why aren't we talking about same-sex families and trans families in primary? Throw that out there, because you can imagine what the answers would be, so why? Thank you, Sue. I'll get Evan to answer that question. Well, first of all, thanks for the question. You know, to be fair, I think we could say that about a lot of things. Um, very important issues that just don't get the coverage. So I, I'm not going to, first of all, try to justify a lack of coverage of critical issues. My goodness, we fail on that score all the time for all sorts of moral and economic and uh, editorial reasons. So um, you know, I'd just acknowledge that what you're saying is true. Uh, I would also say um, that there was a lot of coverage of these issues. I mean, one of the biggest debates, for example, in Ontario was about the educational curriculum and LGBTQ issues. And it was a very divisive, very important, and, and much covered issue. Um, and it got an enormous amount of attention and well deserved to be candid. And it became an issue because it became a very big campaign issue for uh, the Doug Ford government in Ontario. I don't know if what it was like in Newfoundland and Labrador, but it was certainly a big one in Ontario. Um, where, where, and, and in Alberta, it also became a very big issue when Jason Kenney uh, talked about uh, whether parents should be informed if young people can have to be told, their parents should be told that they've joined an LGBTQ club because for safety reasons, they didn't want to tell their parents because their parents were the danger. And Jason Kenney felt in his inimitable wisdom yeah. that they should be informed. Okay. Uh, so I think there's been a lot of coverage of certain issues, but um, I don't. I just I just say you're. I, I just the best I can do is acknowledge that you're right, and we need to do better. And and saying we try sucks, but uh, there are some examples where it's good, and there's too many examples where we just suck. But but Sue, can I say this to somebody as you know comes from uh, histories in the Conservative Party? Can I tell you it is actually. Oh, is it that bad to say? <laughs> Jesus, I know they don't like Harper here, but occasionally they'll turn the lights on. Uh, but, but to see actually Sheer derided for his asinine position on marching, not marching in pride parades, and to have, as happened uh, yesterday, uh, Sarah McIntyre, the former press secretary of yeah. the prime minister, say, I can't vote for a conservative who does that, uh, was really refreshing to see. Uh, and it will continue, I hope. Uh, we now have a question. Some old parliamentarian guy just re-elected uh, has a question for us. Is that you, Jack Aaron? Sorry. Well, I, I was going to pass because I'll have a chance uh, in the House of Commons soon again. Uh, but I do. I, I did want to say during this campaign, I, I guess the, if I start with the question, Evan, it would be to you. How long do we have to listen to the national media during a, an election campaign talk about the horse race and how close it is between two guys fighting for 32% of the vote when something else entirely is going on? And as a result of this, we end up with what you know some people call uh, strategic voting. Strate that sounds yeah. good, strategy, you know, investment strategy and all that sort of stuff. But really is voter suppression. 
Now, John Manley thinks that that's fair, that's the name of the game, and that's how you win, et cetera, et cetera, going back to Amanda. But is there room in this new parliament for more than one thing? Can we, can we, do, uh, can we do something with, with uh, a drug plan? Can we look after a, a, a credible plan on climate change and a consensus around that? And can we say it's time to end this battle for 38% of the vote and 100% of the power? That's what's making the, the, the how difficult and making the why more important. And I get, I get the why business, and I'll pass it on to Jugmeet, and hopefully he'll rise to the occasion. It's good to see Jack Harris hasn't lost his speechifying skills, but I didn't want to cut him off as a newly elected <laughs> member of parliament. You know, I, the mark of a great parliamentarian is to say something that totally condemns you, and yet I feel like he somehow complimented me. Even though <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was well done, Jack. I welcome back. <laughs> You gave my eulogy, and I'm like, gosh, I'll throw the first piece of dirt on that poor bastard. Uh, you know, I w listen, the media takes an enormous amount of responsibility, and, and people that just say the media, oh, we just cover what people want, I get it. We, have, we make editorial choices that are uh, an act of responsibility that is, that is very real. But the truth is, um, what I'm trying to get at is getting out of this blame game. It's not the media's fault any more than it's the politician's fault. You know, rational self-interest drives campaigns. Mm -hmm. They gotta win. And we should just acknowledge that's the way it is. Now, we have set up a series of rules. Now, I don't wanna make a sports analogy. I've just learned tonight that football is bad, but thermostats are good. So in that, <laughs> I didn't know that. So if you're trying to heat the house, you gotta turn up the thermostat because that's the only tool you got. And I will say this, God, I, I'm just so full of idiotic aphorisms, but I realize I'm more and more guided by basically a series of high-end bumper stickers, but this is what my life is. There was a, the old, like I think it's a Marxist thing where they say, you know, your ideology determines the tools you build. But once you build your tools, your tools start to determine your ideas. If all you got is a hammer, all you can do is hit stuff. Our ideas built the tools we've got, which is this democracy. Once we built it, all we can do is function within it. The job now is to figure out if we want to change the tools we've got, because the tools are now determining our ideas. You know that's happening. That's the dynamic that's happening. That once you build the tools, the tools start to determine the ideas. And that's why we're getting the 33 and 38%. We have to decide if we're going to change the toolbox. And it's tough. And we tried it in 2015, didn't work. And they keep trying it in BC and it doesn't work. So that's, I think, one of the things that's gonna be on the agenda in the new parliament. And maybe Jack Harris is gonna speak about that. My, uh, my rugby nickname used to be the hammer, so I'll have to bring it down in a minute. <laughs> uh, but um, one, any last questions? One la yeah, over there. Take a last question and then we'll uh, conclude. 2015, the big overwhelming outcome for the vote was people attributed a lot to the youth vote. And we talked a lot about climate change this time around and how people were marching in the streets and there was a big youth movement. But of course, the turnout this time around wasn't half as big as it was in 2015 and dropped considerably. What happened to the youth vote? What do you think? Maybe get you both to quickly comment on that. Do you want to start, Amanda? I would say that the biggest thing that drives turnout is competitiveness. So when there's a contest that's clear and something is at stake, turnout goes up. And I think that's true. You can look at the 2008 Obama campaign as a clear example of that, that mobilized lots of voters who are non-traditional, black voters, youth voters, women, and so women actually vote. But you know, non-traditional voters turned out in that election, and they did in 2015 too. And I don't think it's just because of marijuana. A lot of people say, oh, pot legalization got youth out. I don't think that's what it is. But there was something at stake. It was the kind of anti-Harper, it was Trudeau, Mulcair was there, and he people forget, but he was extremely popular. He was one of the most well-respected NDP leaders ever. Like, his popularity was, was quite high. Um, so turnout went up that year. It doesn't surprise me. There was a clear, they were articulating very different policies, different ideas, and it seemed like something was at stake. In this election, again, I don't know what was at stake. I don't know what was being talked about, right? Climate change, I think, is a huge issue for youth voters, a lot of voters, but especially youth voters. Um, and I think that a lot of youth, you know, campus voting went up. I mean, they had more availability of campus voting this year, so that was probably a part of it as well. Um, 
I think that there is a lot of youth engagement, right? When there's something at stake, when parties articulate clear policies and stances on issues, um, and when they don't, like when you think you know what the outcome of this of this is going to be, you don't turn out to vote. In interestingly, in Newfoundland and Labrador, there was only one riding in which turnout went up. In every other riding, it went down. Do we know which riding it went up in? The only really competitive riding where there was a real competition. And so I think that this is one where, you know, parties can do more to ensure that they're, you know, setting up real competition, putting forward camp candidates that are viable. Um, and I think that would make a difference. Quick comment. Um, I totally agree with Amanda. She's 100% right on that. I would just add one last thing about youth engagement. I think we should mistake, we should not make the mistake of saying youth engagement and youth vote is the same thing. We have an incredibly engaged youth movement. They're marching in the streets on issues. Uh, they have joined volunteer organizations and NGOs. Um, what youth want is results, and the cynicism around the federal politics is that they don't believe that their vote means anything, that they can't have an impact, so they have chosen other, it's not like they're sitting around doing nothing. This is the most informed and in some ways the most engaged youth movement. When they can be engaged, as Amanda says, in competitive races, all of a sudden they show up and go, what's happened? Where have they, they've always been engaged. They just haven't bought the product the federal politicians are selling. And so they've taken their energy and they've gone to smaller organizations in their community and other movements that they believe that they can get out in. We have an incredibly engaged, informed, positive, brilliant, ingenious young movement. And the crisis is why our federal, they don't believe it's that crisis of trust and authenticity and all those deficits that we've got. If we can get them to believe that their vote makes a difference as it can in, in close races, they'll come out. But you know, you know, you don't want to go to a party where you don't feel you're welcome, and and that's how they feel. So I think or it's there, yeah, or nothing, or they won't. Have, so I think, uh, you know, I think they will come, and I think that it's not that they've disappeared or they're slackers. Or uh, I have actually an enormous amount of faith in young people, and and in our democracy, we have to welcome their ideas in by making sure that they see results. People, look, man, it's a results-driven culture. Uh, any quick, quick being the operative word, uh, last comments from either of you on, on the evening before I turn it over to Dr. Greenwood. I'd just like to say thank you. Uh, can I just say what an act of optimism to see this place sold out for a journalist. Uh, this is more people than I talk to on television. Uh, <laughs> like triple my audience, it's amazing. Uh, no, I just honestly, uh, the, the engagement, the questions, the incredible hospitality of my dear friend and, and new friends and Deb who cooked us dinner last night who's a miracle and put me in my place. I didn't talk with Deb around. Uh, but I just want to say thank you for welcoming my son and for us. Uh, this is a brilliant province that has punched above its weight in creatively, culturally, in so many ways. It's a microcosm. The things that are happening here, you guys are the sentinel species. The alienation, the frustration, the economic difficulties are happening here and everyone is about to feel them. Uh, this is a very important place in the world and in our country. God, I'm fucking tearing up. It's totally middle age, but I mean it. It's heartfelt and generous, and it it. Uh, oh my God. I'm I I I. Listen, I deal with so much cynicism, and to see people who care so profoundly about this beautiful country, and who get beyond themselves despite the difficulties here, which are real, for me renews my, like I'm a skeptical optimist, but I just want to say genuinely thank you for treating us with the kindness and the optimism that I just don't see enough. And it's a, just thank you. And I mean it. I can't believe I get in tears. I'm so old now. <laughs> I'm getting old, I can't stop it. Amanda? I can't possibly top that, I'm a girl. I can't cry right now on stage. <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> oh. He would call that his Newt Rockney speech, so he would bring in another football reference. I'd only add, add one thing, and I, I thank everybody for for, for welcoming my friend, and uh, I forgot to say this in the beginning, 
uh, was one quick call. Will you come to Newfoundland after the election, knowing how busy he has been to speak? And he came without any hesitation. And thank you, and thank you for bringing Gideon. The other group I want to compliment, because they've just gone through uh, 40 days of hell, uh, and they're here listening to all of them. All of us talk about them, are the elected officials and unelected officials who ran in the election who are here, Seamus and Jack and Sean and Danny and... Uh, it's still a pretty damn hard thing in this era as we've just witnessed to put your name on the ballot, to do it a number of times, to live through the scrutiny, to constantly he hear all of us tell you you're a bunch of idiots and you don't know what you're doing, uh, but you do it, you show guts, you show courage, and thank you to all of you who put your name on the ballot, continue to do it. We can't improve this country unless more people continue to do it, and those of you who have done it just stay doing it and contribute. So thank you very much for doing that. And now, I, I guess we will you can stay here, or we're, Dr. Greenwood will come up to conclude the evening. John Perlin, it's almost bedtime. You've done very well. I'll wrap this up quickly. Uh, Evan, Amanda, and even Tim, great job. Uh, irreverent, passionate, thoughtful, informed. More F words than any previous Galbraith. <laughs> it's like a normal day in the Harris Center office, actually. <laughs> but, <laughs> but thank you, superb, superb job, superb engagement by the audience. Uh, we recorded tonight's session, and we'll be posting it on the Harris Center website if you'd like to watch it again or share it with folks who weren't able to attend. Stay tuned to the Harris Center's newsletter and social media channels to hear about other upcoming events, lots more between now and Christmas. Uh, next week, we'll be launching the sixth annual Vital Signs Report. Don't miss that, November 6th, right here, and that's always a big day in the province. Uh, thank you to the Alumni Engagement and Harris Center teams, amazing job, and the Signal Hill Campus team. And most of all, thanks to all of you for coming out, as Evan noted. Democracy depends on people showing up and engaging. Filling this room is a great sign that Newfoundlanders and Labradorians are keen to engage, to ask why, and to figure out how, together. Thank you. Wonderful close to reunion week. Have a great night. Good night. Thank you.